If you think that there really is energy in bonds, then you would imagine breaking those bonds open releases that energy, which is totally false. Okay. But I want the energy to be in here because that's where I get my energy. Okay. Well, I would say that the energy of these bonds is less than the energy in the bonds of products you could create. I just think that it is a less useful cognitive tool. Things are bound not but by the takes, energy they have, it takes but energy. by the energy they have lost. Right. Really guys? Do the bonds in sugar store energy? Are they a sign of lost energy? Doesn't it seem a little silly to argue about this? Before we go on, let's all get a clear picture of what's going on here. For those who've taken high school chemistry or biology, you've likely come across this chemical equation. Using energy from the sun, plants take water and carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen and glucose. At a later convenient time, the plant can reverse this process and use the energy that it previously stored in the sugar to sustain itself. Or an animal will eat the plant and it will use the energy. Hank says that this picture of glucose storing energy is a good one. After all, it serves the purpose of teaching us how energy moves from the sun to plants and perhaps to other organisms eating those plants. However, Derek argues that this view is misleading. Why? Let's take a look at chemical potential energy as we shift between the two sides of this equation. Here is the energy that these atoms have when they are just bonded as water and carbon dioxide. Using the energy of the sun, these atoms can be kicked into an arrangement called the transition state, before settling into arrangements of glucose and oxygen. Later, an organism can give some glucose and oxygen another little kick. Although processing the sugar gives back more energy than it takes, it still takes energy to break the bonds in the first place. Here's where we see Derek's argument. No matter which side of the graph we look at, we can see that chemical bonds are just what happens when atoms fall into particular arrangements from higher potential. In fact, this picture can pretty much explain any kind of bond, no matter what the mechanism. A bond fundamentally is a sign of lost energy. So, which is the best picture? Do we consider the bonds in glucose to have stored energy or lost energy? Well, problems like this often seem clearer if we compare them to analogous but more tangible situations. For example, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with red rubber balls rolling around hills and valleys. Give a ball a little kick, and it will tend to settle at the base of a valley. Let's imagine that this ball is kicked with enough energy to reach the top of a hill and settle into a hole. Now, let's ask ourselves, why is this ball here? Do we consider it to be high up, or do we consider it to be in a hole? Well, those two ideas are both technically correct, but it would seem odd to argue for one over the other. Surprisingly, this situation is very similar to our glucose reaction, except we are dealing with gravitational potential as opposed to chemical potential. Back to our view of glucose. Why does this glucose exist? Do we consider it to have stored energy with respect to the products of the reaction? Or do we consider it to have lost energy from some arbitrary transition state? Once again, both views are technically correct, so it seems odd to argue between them. But of course, this isn't an argument about the most correct view. This is an argument about the most conceptually helpful view, and both views have conceptual advantages. Hank's picture of having stored energy seems to work well, because it acknowledges how the glucose was actually created and what role it plays in biology. Meanwhile, Derek's picture of having lost energy also seems to work well, because it acknowledges all chemical bonds for what they fundamentally are, a loss in energy. In the end, the best view really depends on what angle you approach the problem. Let's at least all agree on the bigger picture here, because this particular argument doesn't seem to be leading us anywhere. But I'm glad everyone came to this realization in the end. That's a good stopping point. Isn't it? <laughs> Let's bring out a skunk! <laughs> <laughs> Hank, Derek, keep making awesome science videos. Thanks for watching the whole video. If you liked it and want to see more, please feel free to subscribe. And if you're not already subscribed to SciShow and Veritasium, you should be. Everyone working on these channels produces great stuff, so be sure to check them out. Thanks again! Let's bring out a skunk! Okay...